thank you for joining us for today's Missouri Trailblazers program on Hallowell Davis from the Missouri State Museum. My name is Lauren Williams and I'm Adult and Community Services Manager for the Daniel Boone Regional Library. So today's program is the fourth of our Missouri Trailblazers series. Um, and on the third Tuesday of each month, from now through August at 1 p.m., the Missouri State Museum staff will present a variety of these virtual lunch and learn programs that offer tales of some of the interesting people that have called our state home. So a trailblazer is someone who has impacted our culture through major events, leadership, innovation, and more. And I want to say a special thank you to Carrie Hammond uh, at the Missouri State Museum for organizing these presentations. And today we have with us Museum Director Tiffany Patterson, and I'll turn things over to her to let us know more about the museum. Hello and welcome. Thanks everybody for joining us. I have uh, want to thank the Daniel Boone Regional Library for initiating this partnership, and we're very excited to bring you these Trailblazer programs um, throughout the summer. I also want to thank a uh, special thank you to the Missouri Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing for um, allowing us to borrow back a previous employee, John Peterson, and also um, for the rest of them, Jeffrey and AJ and Emily to jump on and embrace uh, this particular uh, program. So we're very excited to have them and be partnering with them. And uh, just a couple of things, we invite everybody out to join us at the Missouri State Museum. We are open seven days a week. Um, on Monday through Friday, we're open eight to five, and on weekends, nine to four. Um, we do have several events coming up. In addition to the library programs, we will be doing a, a virtual landing after hours program on June 2nd on the Civil War Commemoration in Missouri. We hope you can join us on Facebook, our Missouri State Museum Facebook page for that. And we also, in June, will start our Backyard Concert Series, which will be an outdoor music event. And our first one for that is June 26th. Um, this is just one of many educational programs that we do. I mean, you can find uh, more about our traveling exhibits, our traveling trunks, um, our virtual tours, and other things at the Missouri State Museum resources page, educational resources page, excuse me. And I will put a link to that um, on in the chat box for anyone who is interested. Um, with that, I want to thank you again. And I'm going to turn it over back to Lauren. Thanks so much, Tiffany. And thanks for sharing that information um, in the chat. Uh, today, our speakers are John Peterson and Jeffrey Spinali. Am I pronouncing that correctly, I hope? Someone will correct me. <laughs> <laughs> um, John is a hard of hearing program manager uh, with Missouri Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. John is hard of hearing, and he has a cochlear implant and hearing aid. His main programs involve getting assistance for people in need um, of resources uh, for hearing aids or just general information on being hard of hearing. And Jeffrey is a deaf advocate with the Missouri Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. Uh, he is deaf and works on programs and advocacy for the deaf and is fluent in ASL. So thank you all for being here and I will turn things over to John and Jeffrey. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for being here. Emily and I are here at the uh, Lowman Building as part of the Missouri State Museum. And uh, you see AJ as to our interpreter. And then we have uh, Jeffrey on too. And Jeffrey, did you want to say anything before we get started? I was muted. <laughs> he said, I'm very happy to be here with you all. Thank you. Our program's gonna kind of be three parts this afternoon. Part one, just a few minutes of <clears throat> myself and Jeffrey, and then we will uh, go to a video where we'll learn more about Hallowell Davis. And then uh, Jeffrey will finish up at the end, kind of give us a perspective on um, how we view deaf education a little differently today than it was viewed during uh, Davis's time. And then all four of us will be here live with you after to answer any questions, engage in any discussion or anything you'd like. So I'm gonna go ahead and share the screen and we'll get started. Okay. 
Hi, good afternoon. I'm John Peterson, Heart of Hearing Program Manager, and we are here at the offices of the Missouri Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. And before we talk about this month's trailblazer, Hallowell Davis, I thought we should just talk a little bit about the Missouri Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. So I want to introduce our deaf community advocate, Jeffrey Spinell. Hi, I'm Jeffrey Spinell, Jr. And I'm the Deaf Community Advocate at the Missouri Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing, or MCDHH for short. MCDHH is a governmental agency that serves the deaf community across the state of Missouri. MCDHH was founded in 1988 with the goal of improving everyday lives of deaf and hard of hearing Missourians. And we do that by providing individual and public services to the deaf and hard of hearing community, organizations, and other state agencies. We have various services such as information, referrals, workshops, trainings, and of course advocacy. We also have programs such as the Missouri Interpreter Certification System, Hearing Aid Distribution Program, and Support Service Programs. In 2019, the Missouri State Museum began compiling a list of Missouri Trailblazers for an exhibit commemorating the state's bicentennial. The focus was to be on those trailblazers that are not common household names, as, the, as these people tend to be widely recognized in other places. Uh, such as in the Capitol, the Hall of Famous Missourians, where you will find Harry Truman, George Washington Carver, Floor Ingalls Wilder, Mark Twain, many others. But today we're going to talk about one of those important Missouri trailblazers who is not a widely known person. A few uh, facts about this person. This person is credited with inventing the term audiology. This person made very early and important discoveries on how brain waves and electrical impulses work in the inner ear and brain. These studies revolutionized our understanding of hearing. This person was among the first to really study and understand how noise exposure impacts hearing, particularly among veterans. When this person passed away in 1992, he was recognized as a major pioneer in the science of hearing. Of course, we are talking about Hallowell Davis, who for many years served as director of research at the Central Institute for the Deaf in St. Louis. Shortly after Davis's death, a biographical memoir was published in several places, it was noted that he had a famous sense of humor. And you can read this here uh, where his um, biographer said that Davis told him when he invented the word audiology in the mid-1940s, it was because the military equivalent then in use, auricular training, sounded like a project to teach people how to wiggle their ears. Before we talk about Hallowell Davis's accomplishments, we need to spend a few minutes talking about how hearing works. This will give us some context in order to understand the importance of Hallowell's discoveries and studies. Okay, so now we're, we're going to look at a really interesting website uh, called the Interactive Ear by Amplifon.com, and it, it will show us how the uh, ear works and how hearing works. So let me share my screen. Okay, so here we have the, the interactive ear site. And like I said, I think you're going to enjoy this. It's a good site. So we'll kind of follow the uh, path of hearing through the ears. So, as you see, sound energy is collected here by the outer ear, the part of your ear that sticks out from your skull is called the pinna, and it collects sound energy. The sound energy moves through the ear canal, and then when it hits the uh, eardrum, 
it starts the vibration going and you see a eardrum starts vibrating the eardrum is extremely sensitive it it takes very little sound energy to cause it to vibrate and then here we see the the three bones of the middle ear the ossicles and what they do is they amplify the sound vibrations and send those amplified vibrations uh, into the uh, cochlea. So these vibrations then cause uh, the fluid of the cochlea to move, and that movement of the fluid uh, starts the tiny hair cells moving. And then as the hair cells move, this causes uh, the hair cells to create nerve impulses. And these nerve impulses then are sent from the cochlea into the auditory nerve and the cochlear nerve uh, sends these nerve impulses into the brain and uh, the brain will then interpret the sounds that we hear so this is kind of a, a just a quick review of how uh, hearing works One of the key discoveries in hearing during Davis's time was an understanding of how hair cells work and the cochlea. These are actually sensory cells comprising the organ of corti. Vibrations cause fluid movement within the cochlea. This movement makes the hair cells sway. You can envision it sort of like plants swaying at the bottom of the ocean due to wave action. This swaying um, in turn creates nerve impulses that feed into the auditory nerve. Thus vibrations are the sensory cell inputs and nerve electrical impulses are the output. Your brain interprets, interprets these impulses as sounds. If the hair cells are damaged due to disease, noise exposure, or other means, they are permanently impaired. This is why hearing loss originating in the inner ear is typically permanent. As you can see here, hearing loss affects many. Um, it's estimated there's over 37 million people in the United States that have some kind of hearing loss. Uh, over 8 million wear hearing aids, and it's estimated that 20 million more could benefit from them. Uh, roughly 100,000 people have uh, cochlear implants in the United States. You can see this affects not only um, adults, but teens as well. Uh, it's, it's estimated 15% of teens have some kind of hearing loss, uh, primarily due to uh, loud, loud and continual noise exposure. Uh, roughly 600,000 people in the United States identify as deaf. And it's estimated that those who use Ameri American Sign Language, ASL, as their primary language range from 100 to 500,000. Unfortunately, 80% of those with mild to moderate levels of hearing loss do not seek help. The high cost of hearing aids scares many away from seeking help. Uh, this is a topic of major concern in American healthcare. Let's, let's look a little bit at uh, different kinds of hearing loss. Conductive hearing loss, uh, this is hearing loss that originates with problems in the outer or middle ear. Sometimes it's something as simple as um, uh, wax impacting uh, the, the ear canal. Conductive hearing loss can often be uh, treated with medicine or surgery and it can often be fixed. Sensioneural hearing loss we talked about originates in the cochlea and it's uh, caused by problems in the inner ear or the hearing nerve and this is usually permanent. Uh, people who have mixed hearing loss will have a combination of conductive and sensorineural hearing loss. Auditory neuropathy, this is when there's nerve damage or nerve dysfunction and the brain cannot um, understand the nerve impulses that, are, that it's receiving and interpret these as sound. Now let's talk about uh, Hallowell Davis and some of his accomplishments. 
I want to read just a brief um, description of Davis's life from his biographical memoir. Hallowell Davis was born in New York City, uh, the oldest of four children of Horace A. Davis, a lawyer, and Anna Norwood Hallowell. He died in St. Louis nine days before his 96th birthday. When he was 12, the family moved to Boston, where he graduated from a private boys' school in 1914. He graduated with a degree in, in chemistry from Harvard College in 1918, and he graduated from the Harvard Medical School in 1922. He was married three times, and with his first wife, Pauline Allen, who unfortunately died uh, uh, pretty young in 1942, but uh, with Pauline, he fathered three children. After a few years of study and work abroad, uh, Davis returned to Harvard as one of its first biochemical students, and it was director of the Psychoacoustic Laboratory. It was here in the early 1930s that he became very interested in electroencephalography, a really big word, uh, we can call it an EEG, measurement of brain waves. Davis felt this was the key to understanding the inner ear and how neurological impulses are transmitted to the brain. The first brain waves recorded in the United States were those of Davis's own brain, as recorded by one of his graduate students, uh, using the device you see here in this slide uh, in 1933. He was also the first to record an EEG using the, the graphic recorder made, as you can see here, this was made from a, a telegraph machine. One of Davis's colleagues described the early EEG machine uh, thusly. The instrument filled five six foot tall relay racks, one of which was well weighted down by 300 pounds of batteries to prevent sources of vibration, such as footsteps, from shaking the most sensitive of its 47 vacuum tubes. By the way, Albert M. Grass, uh, he was Davis's research instrument engineer. In 1933, Grass founded the Grass Instrument Company, which still today makes EEG machines and other medical devices. You have to kind of wonder how uh, they felt about having their brain waves recorded back in the 1930s. This certainly fascinated the public. Many popular magazines such as Life published photos and articles of their work. You can see by this photo here. At Harvard, Hallowell and his team pioneered the discoveries of the pathway of electrical impulses through the inner ear and into the brain. In 1952, at the British Association for the Advancement of Science, uh, Hallowell demonstrated how hair cells in the inner ear transform sound vibrations into electrical impulses for the brain to interpret. Here is one practical application that came directly out of Davis's research. Hallowell really was a true trailblazer in the field of electrical response audiometry, which enabled not only the understanding of how neurological impulses are transferred to the brain via the cochlea, but also how to measure it. By measuring it, diagnosis of problems is made much easier. This enabled the creation of a hearing test in which the patient did not need to respond, thus allowing for testing and early diagnosis of hearing difficulties in infants. A later but related practical application coming out of Davis's research was the development of cochlear implants, which can send electrical impulses to the cochlear nerve in lieu of a severely damaged inner ear. However, before bionic ears could be developed, researchers like Hallowell Davis had to discover how the inner ear and brain work in hearing. And here you can see um, cochlear implant. There's a, a sound processor on the outside of the skull. And this will uh, pick up sound energy, 
directly convert it to electrical impulses fed through the cochlea into the cochlear nerve, uh, bypassing the normal way that sound energy would create vibrations through the, uh, the eardrum and the middle ear. Davis and his family return, um, I'm sorry, Davis and his family, they moved to St. Louis in 1946 when he accepted a position as director of research at the Central Institute for the Deaf. Hallowell also taught in Washington University's medical school. He spent the remainder of his career and his life in St. Louis. Major research projects that Davis undertook in St. Louis, which came out of the after effects of World War II, were investigations into the effects of noise exposure on veterans. Obviously, war and military equipment generate much noise. Hallowell served as an ambulance driver actually in France in World War I, and when World War II began, he looked to serve as well. He was involved working with various military research projects, mainly to study the effects of the noises of war on hearing. During the war, he also briefly worked on a project investigating if noise itself could be used as a weapon. In 1958, after studying the effect of jet aircraft noise, uh, Davis, with his typical humor, noted that sound won't hurt a man except for his ears. He continued to actively research the adverse effects of noise exposure well into the 1970s. While at the Central Institute, uh, Davis worked with the Veterans Administration to improve hearing aids for veterans. It was at the Central Institute for the Deaf where Davis really synthesized his research into what we recognize today as audiology. During his life, Hallowell published seven books and hundreds of scholarly articles and papers. This book, Hearing and Deafness, first published in 1947, was in theory written for the layman to understand the science of hearing. It defined audiology and it actually ended up becoming the field of audiology's first textbook used in many universities throughout the country was continually updated and reprinted into the 1970s. Five universities, uh, including Washington University in 1973, awarded Hallowell Davis honorary doctorates at various times. In 1976, President Ford presented Hallowell Davis with the nation's most prestigious science award, the National Medal of Science. Uh, you see here for fundamental research on nerve potentials, electroencephalography, and mechanisms of hearing that have formed the basis for advances in neurophysiology, neurology, otolaryngology, excuse my pronunciation, um, acoustics, occupational health and safety, and pediatrics. So he was involved in a great deal of research involving hearing. In Hallowell Davis's biographical memoir, uh, the editor stated, his final contribution to science are the stained histological sections of his temporal bones, which reveal to the experts in such, manners, in such matters the cochlear hear cell anomalies, abnormalities, typical of a severe hearing loss. Upon his death, in other words, Davis donated his inner ears to science. He had age-related hearing loss. Are lip reading and spoken English the only forms of communication used in deaf education? That is not so. In the late 1800s to the mid-1900s, Many educators, such as Hallowell Davis, were advocates of using an oralist approach. And this approach emphasized lip reading and spoken English in order to educate deaf students. At the time, American Sign Language, or ASL, was viewed as broken or as a simplified version of English. 
It wasn't until the 1960s that a linguistics professor at Gallaudet University, who was named William Stokey, had published various documents and works that had recognized ASL as a fully formed human language that is on par with any other spoken language, much like English. He arrived at the conclusion that ASL met all the criteria needed of a language. This included phonology, morphology, semantics, and syntax. At this time, the civil rights movement was starting to gain traction, and this inspired him to pursue a ethnic and minority study, which then led to the deaf culture study. These days, deaf people are officially recognized as a ethnic group, as well as a linguistic minority. ASL now is widely recognized as a language and is the preferred language of educators of the deaf. ASL is now taught in many public schools and colleges. It's used as a foreign language credit that is offered to both hearing and deaf students. Now, deaf people are finally accepted in public education and their preferred communication styles can be accommodated to in either speaking, signed, or both languages, which is pretty cool. Davis and Stokey both played a vital role in the shaping of the lives of deaf people here in America today. Me and John now have some time to answer any of your questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, we are back. All right, if you have questions for our presenters, you can type those in the chat or you can raise your hand and I can unmute your microphone. Uh, I will start with a question. Uh, do you know how um, Davis got interested in this field in the first place? Did he have firsthand experience with somebody who was deaf or um, was there some other inspiration or is that known? Um, actually, he started out wanting to be a chemist uh, when he was at Harvard. And he actually, I, I think his undergraduate work was looking at blood chemistry. Between his undergraduate and medical school, he spent a year studying, I, I think, in Cambridge. And he ended up studying under a professor there who was looking at, um, I guess, um, physiology of um, energy, um, electrical impulses to nerves and things like that. So I, I guess he really got started on this field uh, from kind of veering away from chemistry, given his year abroad in England. I, I don't know, but I didn't find any reference to anyone in his family uh, being deaf or anything like that. He himself uh, had pretty poor hearing, especially later in life. Do you mind spotlighting Jeffrey as well? Oh, sure. very small on the screen. Got it. There we go. Um, something else that the image of the of the infant with the uh, having an infant hearing test. I remember that from my own children. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how that how that works? What is it measuring? Um, that's just fascinating to me that that you can test hearing without needing a response from the person being tested. Yeah, you, as of course you know, if you have hearing tests. You go and they're like, press the button when you hear the beeps, uh, repeat this word after me, repeat this sentence after me. You can't do that with infants. You can't do that with, with some adults. And so it was important to develop some kind of hearing test in which people did not need to respond to the uh, audiologist. And one way to do this was um, they kind of set a baseline. I'm not an expert in this. So Please excuse my explanation, but they kind of set a baseline with the infant, sort of the infant at rest, the infant kind of in a rest, I, I don't know, like a sleeping position. Then they uh, will expose the infant to certain kinds of sounds, look at the changes in the brain waves, 
if the infant isn't hearing the sounds, uh, then the brain waves aren't going to react to the sounds like they would if the infant was hearing them. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, oh, I wanted to say one thing too. In the video, you saw the EEG machine. It's this gigantinormous machine, five Lee ray, relay racks. Today, you can essentially do this with something akin to the cell phones. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's incredible because that was an impressive, impressively sized uh, piece of equipment. We do have um, some questions in the chat now. I'll read the first one. Um, one of Davis's wives is famous in EEG for being the first to study auditory evoked potentials during sleep. Do you know anything about, about her? Uh, yes, she was his, I believe his first wife. She unfortunately passed away in uh, 1942. But um, yeah, she was uh, a scientist in her own right. And she was instrumental, particularly in measuring brain waves when people are asleep. I could be wrong, but I think she was the one who recorded his brain waves. Uh, when his brainwaves were the first ones that were recorded with the EEG machine. I think his wife might have been the one operating the machine, but if somebody knows better than me, please chime in. Sounds pretty romantic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they were a good, a good pair. Um, we also have a question. Uh, is there anywhere to learn ASL in or near Columbia? I've been interested in it for a long time, but have not known where to go to take classes. Um. I might pass to Emily or Jeffrey. Yeah, um, I can have Jeffrey fill in um, if he's got more resources. Um, they do um, teach community-based sign language classes at the lead, or excuse me, it's called Deaf Lead Now, which is on West Ash, kind of up behind the mall. Um, those are usually on, um, I believe it's Monday and Wednesday evenings for beginners. Uh, you can also take classes through the university or through Missouri School for the Deaf in Fulton. Jeffrey, did you have any others that you know of in mid-Missouri? Yeah, I would strongly encourage you to look into ASL Connect. That is a program at Gallaudet University in Washington, D.C., and they do offer online sign language courses as well. So you do have a free online resource as well for basic vocabulary if you want to learn ASL before you even take an in-person class. Everything's online. They provide an interpreter. It's very accessible. You can do everything basically from the comfort of your own home. I, I might add, um, and I hope I'm not embarrassing Jeffrey, but I'm trying to learn ASL and I found a site online called Sign School and you will see uh, videos of Jeffrey if you go to the Science School site. So you can learn ASL from Jeffrey. I'm putting some of these links in the chat. <laughs> yeah, perfect, thank you so much. Science School is also a free resource. You can take courses there at Science School. ASL Connect has basic vocabulary that you can learn for free, but some of the courses are paid uh, Deaf Inc. is a resource in St. Louis as well that provides courses as well. I believe uh, that that was shared in the chat as well. Um, there you go. Yeah, Deaf Inc. started offering courses online. Uh, basically, once the pandemic started, they used to offer only in-seat course options, um, but now those are more available to people that are not located in the St. Louis metro. I'm also interested in how um, the deaf community, I think society, excuse me, society at large has often thought of deafness as a problem to be fixed. And um, I know that there's been a great shift um, away from that. And um, um, I loved hearing that, that the deaf community is now considered its own ethnic group um, and linguistic minority. So can you talk a little bit, maybe Jeffrey could talk a little bit about that evolution um, in the deaf community? Yeah, sure thing. So really it all started uh, at the Milan conference in 1880. That took place in Italy, of course, uh, where there was a lot of educators who were focused in the field of hearing loss and decided that oral education was the best way to teach uh, all children with some form of hearing loss, and that impacted the deaf community at large, especially here in the U.S. 
And that was the same year that the NAD was actually founded. Uh, they had the goal of trying to preserve ASL as a language itself. And since then, we have really been working to uh, develop a culture to preserve our shared identity as deaf individuals and share that awareness of ASL as a language because deaf people uh, like William Stokey now have officially recognized ASL as its own freestanding language. And that really helps give a lot of researchers, you know, credibility into researching what makes that a language. And I think that that really impacted uh, where we are today, uh, especially being recognized as a linguistic minority, developing a culture around that. Thank you. Do we have other questions? Um, are there any historical artifacts from Davis's lab preserved at um, CID or Wash U? Yeah, I, I think his uh, original EEG machine is at a, a medical museum at a Harvard. Uh, I also believe a lot of his records, photos, I presume artifacts, some of his equipment, things like that, would, would be uh, conserved at um, Washington University and the Central Institute for the Deaf. So. I'm putting in the chat the link to the Missouri Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. Um, if people want to check out more about the work that you do, um, that's all the questions that I think we have. Is there anything else that you wanted to say about uh, the Missouri Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing and the work that you do? What do you want to say? <laughs> um, I, I guess I'll just throw in there. Um, we are the kind of central state agency that has anything to do with um, matters of deaf and hard of hearing people. So if you know somebody who is deaf or hard of hearing that's looking for resources within the state of Missouri, um, we can help with that. And also if you as an individual or an organization you're affiliated with would like to learn more about how you can better accommodate people with hearing loss, or include them within your communities or even just uh, prepare people in your organization to be more of service and accessible. Um, that's definitely something that we could put you in touch mostly with Jeffrey or John, depending on the particular audience you're looking at to um, give them a more inclusive experience. That's great, thank you, that's good to know. As a representative of an organization where we serve all kinds of people, so yes. thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> appreciate that. Well, um, any other final questions from our viewers? All right, well, I'm going to um, put a few other links in the chat. Uh, the Missouri State Museum, I want to thank them for their work organizing today's presentation and our past and future Trailblazers um, sessions. Uh, our next event is going to be in June, and that is going to be on Laura Ingalls Wilder. So I've put the event link in the chat for that as well, if you'd like to go ahead and register um, for that event. I want to thank you, John and Jeffrey and um, AJ for interpreting, uh, all of you for being here today. Um, Emily, thank you as well. And uh, thank you, all you out there in Zoom land watching. Again, this session has been recorded, so it will be available on the Missouri State Museum's Facebook page here probably within a week or so, so that um, the recording can be, can be viewed. Thanks for spending your time with us and have a great rest of your day. Thanks.